Yeah, well, thanks a lot. I had no idea why I was invited because this is about food and I don't know anything about food else than if you eat something it, and it doesn't get up again, it hasn't done you any harm. And he says, no, but it's about guts. And I said, yeah, guts, entrails. I don't know anything about entrails. And he said, no, guts like courage. And I'm like, yeah. And he said, yeah, yeah guts like the courage to be honest. And I was like, okay, let's talk about that. And then when we talk about the courage of being honest, I don't mean you know, like just saying, speaking out like, like, oh, you're ugly, you got a big nose, this tastes like shit. That's not being honest, that's being rude and disrespectful. And, and we have a saying, you know, you should hear honesty from, from uh, d uh, children and, and, and drunkards, but, but that's not honesty. I mean, when you wake up the day after with, with moral, you know, oh, what have I done? You, you haven't been honest, you've just been stupid. That's, that's not being honest. But when you talk about the courage of being honest, it's being honest to true to yourself and true to your your ideals and your ambitions, and and really not just keep just holding on to them. And when we talk about death, I mean, and food, I mean, there's no food suffices but the food of death. And and I'll try and and tell you a little story about a guy called Sinus I met. But we have to have a prologue, and I have to be very quick about it. Uh, you see, I, I was born a long time ago on a small Danish island in, in 1960, and I mean, when it, it was so empty there, there was nothing. It, it was a little village. When the sun got down, when the sun went down, you got your eyes picked out. That's how dark it was there. And in that darkness, I heard a voice singing, "Schlaf, Kindlein, Schlaf." Dein Vater hüt die Schaf. That was the voice of my mother, and she happened to be German, which is a very bad idea. Uh, you know, and I grew up understanding that I was the German swine, she was Hitler's bitch, and, and I was greeted with C. Kyle, and I was a bastard. Now, now, the thing I had was, of course, the language, and I had my gra grandmother in Germany, in Frankfurt, where the German poets waited for me. I had to learn to read Gothic uh, <laughs> letters to read them. And, and there I read the German romantics, and when I went home, I went through the fields of, of, of sugar beets and reciting German poets in the darkness. And I remember when I was about 13 years old, I was down in Frankfurt again, and just around, around the corner there was a publishing firm. Uh, you probably won't know it, uh, but it's called Insel Verlag. It's the most renowned German publishing house there is. They published Rainer Maria Rilke, Hugo von Hofmannsthal, the shit. And when, when you see, when you're little, you do something which you don't know. You, you have ideals. And I swore to myself, one day I'm going to get published there. And I know that when I get published there, I'm home, because I didn't have a home. I was socially excluded. So I swore to everything I will get published there. And at that point, I ruined my life because they don't publish Danish authors. They, not when they're alive, you know. They, they, they publish three persons, Hans Christian Andersen, Hermann Bang, and E.P. Jakobsen. I ruined my life. And so I wrote poems, and I studied literature, and I did that until I was 35. <laughs> and I had studied 17 years at the university, and I had gotten nowhere. I ended up photocopying my articles, my poems, and I sold them 10 kroner a piece on the street, which is ridiculous, which meant I had lost. I had lost it. I only knew one person who ever got a job which was in advertising. And I asked him, can I get a job? And he said, but Knu, what, what are you capable of? Nothing. And he said, then advertising might be something for you. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, well, thanks, we, we don't have any time, because this is only the prologue. Uh, and, um, and, and what happened is, of course, that instead of writing poetry, I now made, 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 I was an advertiser, copywriter, and I did well, and after four years, I was head of the biggest Danish advertising firm there is, with half a billion kroner turnaround, and I was feeding 250 people with ideas every day, and I never left my, my office because I'm, I'm a person, they, 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 you know, there's a type of person called insecure overachievers. That's me, you know? And I'd earned a lot of money for the firm, not that money for myself. One day the telephone called, and that was Lars von Trier, our director, and he said, Knu, do you want to be in a movie? And I said, can I have the, some drugs also? And he said, no, 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 you just have to play yourself. The movie is called The Idiots. 
And, and, and suddenly, I was standing, you know, I mean, four years after being at the end of the world, I had nothing. I was a social loser. I suddenly earned a lot of money, and I stood on the red carpet in Cannes. And I looked over the, the, the palm trees and the, the Mediterranean Sea, and I, I thought, this is ridiculous. Satan gives me everything but the one thing I want, writing poetry and getting published at Insel. And I could see my star was, was starting to fade, and actually I was clinically depressed. I had to buy a new suit every week because it stank, because I never, um, my home was one big wreck. I had closed the kitchen door. Even the doves had come in and made, made their nest there. It was stinking. The, the, the whole apartment, it was filled with, with animals, and, and, and it was horrible. And, and one day, at, I, I took, at, at the millennium, I took to Iceland, where Björk had her New Year's party. We all had to be dressed in white. She was a clown. And I've, I've, I remember standing there in the world's most expensive Berluti shoes. Yeah, that's another story. But, but I, it was ridiculous. When I came home, I had forgotten to turn off the base, uh, the so they had to get into my apartment, and suddenly they saw where all the animals came from, from my apartment. And, and so I came home to a little letter. They had photoed all my apartment. I was thrown out. And I thought, this is it. I'm finished. Nothing ever came to anything. And, and I wrote an article, which was the first article ever published by me, where I told them how we cheated Bodum for 80 million kroner. Uh, which, of course, meant I was fired the day after. <laughs> and, 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 and I thought, this is great. And I sat on a bar, and I drank myself to death. The funny thing is that when I emptied the bottle, I drank the novel I hadn't written, the wife I didn't get, the children I didn't get, life that never worked out. And when I went, w came to the bottom, a girl, girl came in with a violin, and, of course, she was the door out of that. Now, I sat down on my, 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 my chair and I wrote the novel I should have done long ages ago. It took me three years, 1,001 night. Yeah, with closed eyes, I wrote this, fine and good. Now, before, when I met her, uh, we lived in a small apartment and I was invited to an exhibition, here's the story, um, called um, Money Without Borders. And I knew exactly what to do. I was going to make advertising about the thing I feared the most, social e exclusion. I always was afraid, I have no family, I had no social network, I always thought someday I'll end up on the streets. So I phoned a social organization saying, can you help me? I want to buy all the stuff of a homeless person. You know when they walk around with a, with a card or that. I always wondered what's in the shopping bags. And they said, okay. And I met him uh, in front of uh, Ronetown uh, at the 20th, 2 of December, yeah, it was, uh, there was snow, people were buying stuff, and, and it was night, uh, evening, and I saw him coming up the street with his, with his shopping cart filled with stuff, and he had a long gray beard, and, and, and he was an old man, long hair, and he was, you could see he was Greek, he had this nose, he was tanned, and he nearly didn't say anything, but his accent was Swedish Greek something, yeah? He was a foreigner. And, and I said, well, I want to buy all your stuff, don't ask me why, and you can get all I've got. I've got 10,000 kroner left from advertising. I give you that, you give me your stuff. I can't give you more. I'll give it to tomorrow when the bank opens. And he said, tomorrow doesn't exist. And I said, well, I can only give you 4,000 now. That's what I can get from the, uh, the, 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 the bank thing, yeah? And he said, half. And I said, half, 2,000 kroner. And he said, half. And I said, 1,000 kroner? And then something in, my, in, in me stopped me. And I said, no, 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 this is wrong. And I said, I can give you 4,000, you'll get 4,000, not one kroner more, not one kroner less. So I gave the money to him, and then I asked him, excuse me, I don't want to interfere, but how did you become homeless? Is there anything I can help you? And he said, Kanud, I thought you bought my things. I didn't think you bought my story. And I said, sorry, but I will tell you one thing, Kanud. My name is Sinas. Do you know what Sinas means? And I said, oh, I started 17 years, no. And, and he said, Sinas, senior is Greek, it means stranger. I am the stranger. I walk like a ghost through the streets. I don't exist here. And then he was gone. And I went behind his shopping chart, or what's it called, there's this wheel thing, and it's really like a ghost, because if you have no money, everything is relationship is money, something for something. If you haven't got anything, you're not in a relationship with anybody. 
You couldn't go anywhere, you, couldn't, you had no relation. Then I went and I opened the chart, which is something you shouldn't do, because you're being, this doesn't work, you're being nosy, and you're uh, there. You're looking into misery. You're not supposed to, to do this. You have to have your morals on the right side if you do this. The horrible thing is that there was nothing in there but stuff for keeping him warm. There was no personal things, not a picture, not a pen, nothing. There was only like, like uh, his trousers, his, his darkness, his <laughs> darkness, and, and sweet potatoes and tea, and, and this is, uh, yeah, this a frying pan, and this is for, you know, when, you, when you, uh, your entrails are getting out. And, um, and like that, and, and it was horrible, and after 20 minutes, it stank, you couldn't breathe in the room, and it was the stench of being poor, of not having anything. Now, what I did was, I called my friends, colleagues in advertising the last time, and I said, I make one last campaign. And so, we took photos of his things, the most beautiful product shots, you can't see it here, and then we made an ad, which you can't see here, but it, it was like so beautiful you could have put it into Vogue Italia. Yeah? We, we took his name and made a logo which was like gold. Yeah? It, 24 hours of, of rendering, seen us. Then I uh, uh, called a, a guy who helped me making stuff for very uh, expensive stores, and we made something in steel and glass, green with his name on, seen us. Just the green button. The green button, oh, cool and it's beautiful, it doesn't matter. But we, you have to have, make it work at last. Um, here you see some ad, and we made this, look like this, and, um, and I put his logo on, and then I, and, and the people, and they, they were like angry, they thought I was going to show him, show his misery, show uh, you make a huge heap of his stuff, and, and make a an human exhibition, like a human zoo. Nothing would be more, more foreign to me. No, what I wanted to do was to make him beautiful, and make him, give him something, do, make him expensive. Yeah? Because he couldn't be uh, com commodified. That's why he was nothing, he was worth nothing, because his stuff couldn't be commodified, his person couldn't be commodified, which meant he was excluded from society. I wanted to include him again by putting, using the poison as medicine. So I had made this, and I said, you can buy it for 75,000 kroner, and I waited for the woman who would understand and have a rich man, and they bought it. <laughs> oh, shit, this was not what I wanted. Uh, and um, they bought it, I gave the money to the organization. Now, what happened is this, that when I, uh, I published my novel, everything was good, I was married, I got children, life, it, it, I succeeded, yeah? Now, after this, many, many years after, I walk on the street with my children and my wife, and suddenly she says, oh, look, they're seen us. And he was again walking there, and I went to him, and I gave him a hug and said, Sinus, I'm so happy to see you, and, and look, I've got a daughter, and, and it, I, I did it, I did it, I did it, you know? And he said, congratulations, Kanud, you showed them, you showed them. And I went like, what? Yeah, you, your novel, you did it. Because my novel had become a huge bestseller, but more important than that, it had become published by Insel Verlag as the first Danish living person. So my star was, was on the... <laughs> That's not the point. Um, and I said, shit, did you read this? He said, yes, Canode, and it is good. And I thought, if I had knew that he would read it, I would never have had the courage to write it. And I said, Sinus, I don't have the time now. Tomorrow, after 12, go down to the bookstore. There's a signed copy for you. Now, I've got small children. And what happens is you can't do stuff. I couldn't get down there. So what I did was horrible because he went, he did, I, he went into the store and said, there's a novel for me. No, there isn't, sir. Please, would you leave? It was horrible. 
And my consciousness, I, I'm, I'm a bit, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't, uh, when I shit, I have sinned God, you know, my karma. This is horrible. And I tried to find him. He hasn't got an address. He hasn't got a phone number. I went around with a mobile soup kitchen. I couldn't find him. I couldn't do good. It was horrible. Now, what happened is that you have to write your second novel, which is horrible, especially if you've got small children and, and you have to have an income. You have no time. So I started drinking and drinking and drinking. I always had a drinking problem. I've taken any drugs on earth. And, and I started drinking more and more, and I didn't have time, and my wife went, you should do this, do that, and I said, shut up, give me time, I have to write. And I, the less time I had, the more we argued, the more I drank, the more we argued, and at last, she went to our doctor and said, Knull, he has to come to, like an uh, antibus in Denmark, it's called, an anonymous alcohol. Uh, he, he has to stop, else I will be divorced. And I said, oh, come on, you idiot, you know, I can stop whenever I want, just give me time to write, and I'll stop and everything will be good. Now, and here comes the point, I was then walk, uh, walking with my, my children, uh, and then suddenly who comes there seeing us? Now, not with a shopping cart, but actually, and I, I, it's the truth, with a baby's thing filled with his stuff. And when I see this, I'm so happy to see you. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Please, have you, well, I, have you got time for me? And I said, time? And, and I said, come on. Yes. And, and we walked. And I mean, they must have looked at us like I don't know what. We went on the street. He didn't want to get in. He didn't want even a glass of water. I took the novel. I made the longest dedication for him ending up with, uh, for you, Sinus, because I'm a stranger too. Now, the, the, the f f extreme thing is that when we walked on the street, he stopped at a church and he looked at me and here's the point of courage and honesty. Because if you're honest, you might learn something. Because he asked, he said to me, Kanud, are you drinking? And I said, yes, of course I'm drinking. The French are drinking. There's Savo Vivre, you know, a bottle a day. And I'm a writer, you know, and it's part of the job description. I, I drink two bottles a day because I'm a poet. I'm a very good poet. I drink three bottles a day. <laughs> I, and I want the Nobel Prize. I'm drinking four bottles a day, you know. And he just looked at me, and then he hit his liver and went like this. And when he left me and I had signed the novel, suddenly my liver hurt. And it hurt like hell. And suddenly I understood, because I don't believe in God, but I do believe in people. And this guy just gave me a hint as big as a church tower. And the, the strange thing is, the moment he, he was gone, I knew I would never, ever drink a drop of alcohol or smoke or do any drugs ever again. And I, suddenly I understood that if I had uh, negotiated, and if I said, oh, I can only give him 2,000, 1,000, if I had wanted to keep the money for myself to some person who hasn't got anything, I would have been the last shittiest person on earth. But doing an, a relation which was one-to-one -one and honest, we could actually meet, which meant that he 10 years after could give me the greatest present of all because he's homeless. I don't know how he ended up on the bench. I only knew that if I kept on drinking, I would end up on the bench beside him. So the beauty of it is that if you are honest, somebody might tell you something you will need, the correct information. If you lie and if you are a hypocrite, you can't get the information. So this is, and I have actually never shown anybody. This is why this was, wrong, but this is the first time I show him, and I don't really know if I'm allowed to, because he hasn't asked me to, and I hope I'm not now doing something horrible. And there's one thing you must know, and that is that I'm not only honest, but I'm also a writer. Cheers.